Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of GameCamp webinar. Today we'll be talking about optimizing game monetization based on the data. Uh, I think very interesting and important topic, uh, especially once you are like trying to grow and scale your game. Uh, we have amazing uh, speakers today. So let's invite uh, to the stage uh, uh, Miroslav Pickhardt, uh, who is head of uh, BI monetization at Jiva. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, from, from, from Prague. Uh, then let's meet uh, Martin uh, uh, Gajarski, who is senior uh, game designer at Pixel Federation, the mobile game studio from Slovakia. Hello, Martin. Hello, everyone. Hi, Marius. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Great. And then let's invite uh, Anastasia uh, Botnik. Uh, uh, she is like apps and gaming industry manager uh, working with uh, mobile game studios in Ukraine, Belarus. So I think like you can actually you know, uh, uh, say a few words by yourself, uh, introduce yourself, like starting from Mirek. Okay, so hello, I'm Mirek. I work for Jiva in Prague. As Marius introduced me, basically, so I'm the head of BI and monetization, and I will be talking mostly about monetizing through special offers and some of the tips how to potentially improve it. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Martin Gajarski. I'm from Pixel Federation, the largest developer in Slovakia. We mostly do free-to-play mobile games. I've been a game design, I'm a lead game designer of Train Station 2, and I specialize mostly in monetization and live ops. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, hybrid monetization optimization uh, based on the experience we have on our, with our two of our games, Train Station 1 and Train Station 2. Great. Anastasia? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anastasia. Um, I, I'm working in Google with the largest uh, gaming and apps uh, customers uh, in Ukraine and Belarus, uh, supporting them on strategy and mostly UA. Uh, today, uh, I will be asking questions to Martin and uh, Mirek uh, to help you better understand the topic. Welcome, uh, everyone. So, as always, we'll be using Slido. So uh, please, uh, even now and during the, the session, please go to the uh, Slido and then enter it uh, using the nickname GameCamp. So as, as always, uh, and then, uh, then you will be able to ask questions uh, and then vote on, on the questions of the other people. Uh, so you can actually uh, ask about any topic or any, uh, anything that is really related to uh, to the topic shared, shared by our amazing speakers, and then uh, I think it will even add, add more value to, to getting knowledge uh, from uh, that perspective. So without uh, uh, going uh, further, uh, let's invite our first speaker, Mirek, who will be talking about uh, special offers and how actually use them uh, for better monetization. Mirek, stage is yours. Okay, so hello, I'll try to share the presentation. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Marius for the great title for the presentation because I couldn't come up with any, so please work. And now I'll try to start. One second, please share. Um, I'll just edit this. Great, now it should look yeah. good, so let's start. So I'll start with an obligatory introduction. Basically, we kind of said some of those things, but I'll repeat it, sorry. So Jiva is a Prague-based studio. It, it works mostly on free-to-play games. It, usually, it originally started doing Flash games, but that's now in the past. And we're focusing on developing games for Android and iOS. The biggest title is Smashing 4. It's also what all these characters you are going to see in the background are from. So we have some good artists, and they are making nice characters. And the game is pretty successful, I'd say. We are like going around 300 to 400 in the top grossing games. It's kind of hard to measure, because uh, it's hard to put the App Store and Play Store data together. But from our assumptions, we are somewhere in that area. And as for myself, I'm now in Jiva for like three years. 
I originally started as a big data scientist and I was hired from banking. And then when I was there, the company grew and we started building a small analytics team. Now we have four people and I have like this fancy title of head of BI, which basically means I'm leading a four person team. And I'm mostly responsible for the game economy, updating it, uh, coming up with special offers, the systems behind them and responsible for monetization of new features. So that's it. And let's move on onwards to the topic. If it's going to be too basic for you, I apologize. I'm totally not sure what the level of the audience is. But if you want, if you have any any more advanced questions, please ask them, and I'll try to answer them in the end. So when I start, basically, what I'm saying is there's like three big questions on delivering great offers, and it would be what to offer. That's like the basic thing, basically, uh, trying to find the content that uh, generates the most revenue for a specific player. Uh, it's a personalization of the offer. It's basically saying that this guy likes this type of content and a different guy likes a different type of content. Like, kind of simple. For how much? Like, it's pretty like obvious that there are people who are willing to spend hundreds, on, hundreds of dollars on their games, and there are people who are willing to spend but like one or two dollars at most. So it's important to find, to find this, the correct price threshold for every player. Because as is stated in the presentation, while not everyone is willing to spend $20 on the game, if you have a user who's willing to spend $20 and you only offer him content for five, you're basically missing on the remaining $15. And the last one is when to show the offer. This is like a very broad topic and I'll try to expand on it. But basically the timing of the offer is can be very important and it can increase the offer conversion several times if you put it correctly like as it says here the question is very broad and we are going to talk about it more a little bit later so moving on uh, what to offer well, what i'm trying to say here is basically before you even start you should come up with some plan i'm gonna start adding some examples from our company while I understand that not every game is the same, uh, there are still going to be some similarities and hopefully you can take away something from this. So what I mean by like identify what you currently have on hand is that when we started doing special offers, we had like this idea. So we are going to build a nice system and it, it's going to have personalized offers for almost every, every type of player. And it's going to like be just fine. But then we, kind of understood that at the time our game had three different chests and two currencies. So if you want to try and create like 50 different offers from that, it's basically impossible because if you only have three types of chests to sell, you can't do anything with it. So, but it's kind of an easy task. You can almost always give this to your designer and hey, we need more stuff to, stuff to sell. Please come up with something. And it's also important to understand how your current monetization works. Uh, basically, again, what it means is be careful of cannibalizing income you already have. And for example, if your game monetizes mostly through in-game advertisement, optimizing special offers might not be like the best way to go. And also the offer, the, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast, so I'm gonna slow down a little bit. The offer is only good if it makes you more money then you lose from the other revenue streams. What I'm trying to say here is that quite often when you make a new offer, it's it, it, it's going to look amazing. You, you will see the thousands of dollars you make, but you have to take into account that at the same time, some of the users just move from buying one type of product into another. So just make sure that you really have a net revenue uplift, not just an, like fake uplift. Uh, again, to illustrate what I'm trying to talk about, here is a chart from our, again, our data. I just pulled data starting from 2019. And this is, this is our daily revenue from premium currency. For us, premium currency is basically the benchmark. It's the stuff that almost every free-to-play game does. When you open a shop, there is some form of gems or gold or something, you know, like the, the hard currency the game has and you can always buy it for real money. So if you look like, we are showing it per player. So basically 
you could see that at the beginning of 2019, we were making like eight cents per player by, se by selling these. And if you look at today's data, it's I'm assuming something like one or two cents at most. So this doesn't seem too good, but if you include the offers in the picture, it's looking way better. So basically, while our offers improved monetization significantly, it also like cannibalized a lot from the gems because like you can see it here, we are selling way less gems, but the overall revenue went slightly up. So we didn't do anything that wrong. Um, jump on the question, I'm sorry. Should I do something? I'm slightly confused here. Hello? Or... Okay. I'm gonna move on for now because I'm not sure. So let's move forward to the presentation. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Yeah, let, let me want uh, wanted to ask a question uh, regarding cannibalization. Um, uh, the question is: uh, uh, Do you have like any advices on how to avoid cannibalization, and uh, how basically do you check the cannibalization? Like, how do you understand like that? Okay, the current revenue stream uh, declined basically due to the offer, not uh, to some other reasons. Okay, so definitely there are several approaches you can take. The one and the, the one basic one that you should always do is A-B testing. So basically you are not gonna roll out the new offer or the new change to your whole player base. You are gonna only ro rolling it out to a specific part of it. And then you can easily measure the KPIs between the control group and this group. So you can basically, let's say that the, the hypothesis is that while introducing a new offer, the old offers will make less money. So you compare the two groups, perform a significance test, and you, in a few days or at most two weeks, find out whether or not the offer was harmful to the ones that were already in the system before. That's the way I would do it. The other one that's like, uh, it's faster, but it's a slightly different approach, is you can have your analyst construct a correlation matrix between the offers and try to find out what offers the types of players buy and if there if there is a correlation between uh, inc negative correlation between the revenue from the two income streams but i'd recommend the a b test if you have the time for it was that enough yeah go on thank you very much okay so i'll try to go on with the presentation let's move forward so I am slightly repeating myself in the slides, but the problem we are trying to solve is basically that for every player in our game, we want to find the product he is most likely to buy. Basically, the product that we, we believe, if we show it to this guy, he's gonna buy it. And you can take multiple approaches how to solve this. I know that several companies, whether it's the game devs themselves or agencies that just consult on it have different approaches. And I'm just gonna try to illustrate the three that we experimented with and have some experience with. And the first, first one is easy. Basically, let's do it fast. Let's just have your designer come up with 20 new offers and randomly send them to players. In this iteration, you will very quickly find out that some of them work better and some of them work worse. For example, to paraphrase, let, let's say if we did a fast offer and say that for every user we, we would just generate a random offer with a random character or random something very quickly you would find that the best characters sell better so before you do a second iteration you would know that you should remove the characters that didn't sell and only do the second iteration on a smaller set of offers or you could add some offers from the learnings you get the strong point is you can start immediately like all you need is like at most one day of designing the offers and then just some randomization and send them out. And you can immediately start measuring the data. The negative here, obviously, is that you will learn that quite a lot of the offers you made are not that good. And before you get to the like end state, it might take you a very long time. The second, op second opinion option is basically eyeballing it. Because 
as the developer or someone who, de who works on the game, you understand your data way better than anyone else. You basically should know everything about the game. And because of that, you should have some basic ideas that work. You should know that, for example, if I'm again going to use data from our game, so let's say that our game is basically similar to Clash Royale in the metagame, in that you collect characters and you collect copies of characters. And when you have enough copies, you level the character up. So if I would be eyeballing it, I can say that I can check the last 10 matches of every user. And I'm going to pick the hero that he played the most. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer that hero to, hero to him. That's like basic logic. And we've been doing this for like a year. And it worked. Like it just just eyeballing it from the randomness increased our revenue from personalized offers by twenty five to thirty percent. I'm not sure about the exact number, but it's between twenty five and thirty. And the last one, I'm calling it the fancy, but it basically means you hire a data scientist, have him crunch the data, do some feature engineering, and build a machine learning model. It's basically eyeballing it, but adding science and hard data to the mix. So you would have someone who's basically going to look through all the data, come up with features he, he thinks might be interesting. Through this way, you might find out that the strongest feature is not the hero he plays the most, but for example, the hero he requests the, mo the most from his friends or, or clanmates, or a combination of both, or a completely new feature that's made from this how many times the player plays per day and the country is from. So just by looking through the data and building new models, you will learn a lot of more advanced uh, approaches how to take it. So we, we are basically, this is what we are trying to do now. I'm not saying we are doing it flawlessly, but we managed to move from the eyeballing to here. And once again, it increased our revenue by, I'm going to say, like 8 to 12 more percent from the eyeballing stage. Uh, I don't only want to say that we are doing good things, because we're not. We're failing, like everyone else, I assume. And I want to talk about this a little bit more. So the first thing that we realized, and it's the ugly picture below I will explain in a few seconds, is that once you start generating like very personalized offers, basically selling your, your players the things they want, you decrease the interest in gacha. And a lot of players that get used to buying the guaranteed offers or the offers tailored to them will just ignore every other offer in the game. Basically, what you are looking at at the bottom part of the screen, it's uh, like this, this was built through a Sankey diagram, but it's basically something that can be called the Markov chain in statistics. And what we are doing is that we are looking at every offer we have in the game in time and tracking how the users progress through the offers. So for example, if the user buys a starter pack and then he buys a special offer 10, uh, the graph generates a very small line between starter pack and special offer 10. So that we know that he first bought a starter pack and after that he bought this. After that, he bought this, and after that, he churned from the game and never paid again. So what you're looking at is the thing called Hero Orb. That was our first like very personalized offer. It basically guarantees you that you will level up the hero that we selected for you and that we find very likely for you to buy. And if you look at the graph, it basically shows that it cycles there. Users that buy Hero Orb are likely to either quit the game completely or just keep buying hero orbs. It doesn't lead to almost any other options. The only one it leads to is the special offer 10 that is next to it. But special offer 10 is something that's usually like very valuable for the player. So what I'm trying to say, like TLDR, is that users who get hooked on hero orbs, they never switch. They just buy hero orbs until they leave the game. So that means that for those users, all the other offers you are like working on, they don't exist. The other thing is the cannibalization I was talking about earlier. And again, for some reason, the chart was supposed to show after the text, but I seem to have made a mistake somewhere. So basically, what we did here, we managed to move our spenders from one product into a second one that was superior. 
So when we started doing special offers, the first one we created is now called the Monday offer because it used to be run on Mondays. It was basically a very small offer, usually two or three dollars, that was aimed at people who want to spend money on the game, but they are not, not that rich. And it contained some like power ups for them for very cheap. It was two to five dollars. And if you can see the data historically, it didn't perform that badly. It was like three to four cents per player. But over time, it started to degrade. It started to degrade mostly because we also introduced the season pass, which accidentally is also released Monday. It's priced at $5 and it creates extreme value for your buck. So the, the better we made the season pass, the worse the Monday of forgot in response. Because if you have two products that release on the same day and one of them gives you like $50 of value and the other one 30, like which one are you gonna buy? So this is something that we are still like dealing with. What we did in the end, we moved the Monday offers from Monday to a different day. And we try to slightly change the targeting so that the correlation between them and the season pass got smaller. Uh, okay, let's move to the second question. For how much? For how much do you want to sell the offers? So I will start with a rhetorical question, like is personalizing price worth it? And I think that just from saying it, the expected answer would be yes. But from what we learned, there's slightly more to it. Because first you want to make sure that for your game and your, your user base, it actually makes sense. You should do some segmentation on your users. Like let's look on what countries they are from, what phones they are using, how long they are playing the game, how long are their sessions, and try to understand the habits and the purchasing power of those players. For example, if you only like market to American CEOs, it really doesn't give you anything else if you create a personalized price for one dollar because those guys wouldn't care. And also be aware of avoiding like potential legal issues. It's not that big of a deal if you're careful, but in some countries it's illegal to sell the same product, like the identical product, for two different prices. So when you, if you are like doing trying to do this, just I just say to be to be careful about it. We have a legal, legal consultant on contract, and apparently it's fine, but I just wanted to mention it here. And how to approach the personalization. And again, I'm going to share a few strategies that we worked with, and I'm going to try to explain how it either worked or didn't for us. So the first one, like regional pricing, something that basically steamed us, or almost every other marketplace that in every country or not every country but in quite a lot of countries you put different prices on the same product and this is something that it works well for steam because they are the marketplace and honestly we try this we try this for countries like india and brazil where we had quite a lot of users coming from but those users weren't really willing to pay us the five plus dollars to actually progress in the game so we try to set some regional prices in those regions. What happened is that while this works on Google Play Store, where you actually can set up the prices, Apple doesn't allow you to do this. Apple basically says we have this price or this price and pick one. So you either end up having different prices between stores, which you kind of don't want to have, or you have to abolish the idea altogether which kind of happened in our case. So as of now, we didn't, ma didn't manage to make this work. We had a, like a very microscopic increase in revenue that wasn't worth all the effort we are putting into it. <coughs> Apologies. Uh, regional pricing, like alternative thing, aside from this, or like a way to sidestep this, is that you prepare different products or different product bundles and you are trying to sell, sell those in different regions. We are doing this, for example, if our starter pack. In fact, we don't have one starter pack, we have three. And based on the country you're from and the phone you are using, you are assigned to one of those three starter packs. Because, you know, they are basically saying that for the like countries that have above average income, we are willing to give them a bigger starter pack, but it costs more. All of them have the same valuation, like the same value 
for example, all of them are 60% uh, discounted, but each of them has different price point and different content. Uh, based on user history, this is one of the ones I kind of like. So, and it's something we are currently using. So for every user, you can easily look at price points the user bought in the past. So again, to illustrate on an example, in our game, you can see a user, he bought a starter pack for $2, then he bought a personalized offer for, for five, and then he bought a season pass for five. So from those data, you can immediately assume that the guy is willing to spend up to $5. And we have some machine learning model on this, so it's more complex than I make it sound. But we are probably going to try to make a personal offer to this user priced at either $5 or slightly above it, so on the next price point above 5 this is very good, but when you use it, it's important to make some weighing function so that the most recent data is more important. Because for example, what might happen is that you have a user who's playing your game for a year. He used to be a CEO. He was making the big bucks and he was buying all the $100 offers you have in your game. But then COVID came, his job got canceled and now he's only paying $2. So again, if you run a simple model, the model might say, okay, this guy is like very rich. Let's try to make a huge offer for him and he will never buy it. So it's important to always prioritize the recent data. Another one is based off out of game, game data. That's basically what I, what I covered when I was speaking about our starter pack. So deliver some content and price based on information that is not from your in-game data, but you have it because those people just play on our servers so you know the country they're from, you know the model of their device. That's basically how our start effects work. And the last one is based on in-game data. Uh, so once again, in mobile gaming, you have almost all the data that your users from your users that, that, you, that you can have you can have. Like almost every click in the application is traced. And if you have a smart analytic team in your company, they could easily come up with some modeling and, and analysis and find out that, for example, for us, users that play at least eight games a day and have a win rate about, I think it was 62.5% are willing to spend more money than different users. Basically, you can do a lot of things if you're in game data and it can lead to some interesting results and hypotheses. Well, I'll do uh, again a short recap. I kind of talked about some of these things, but let's let recap it. So first thing, regional pricing is a pain, especially when Apple is concerned. I already mentioned that you can't set your own prices. Apple has like two variants on regional pricing and you either like variant one or you like variant two, but there's nothing else. The other issue that has begun to, begun to surface recently is that Apple kind of changes those prices. So we found out like after three months that the prices we set for Russia changed because Apple edited the price tier and we tried to sell in Russia, for example, for 55 cents and suddenly it was 80. And we didn't even know. Well, it's our, kind of our mistake because we didn't really talk to Apple regularly, but it changed. Pricing based on his user history performed well for us. I'd say it's one of the better performing models we have running in production right now that is trying to find the best price points for users. And it's the one that I honestly feel the most safe about. It generates us additional revenue. And I would recommend this from the most from the alternatives I went through. And yeah, basically what I was speaking about, it's really recommended to assign more value to recent data because people change. Their situation changes, kind of everything changes over time. I don't know how it is with different games, but we have some players who are with us for like three years now, basically for the whole time since the game started. So it's important to not look all, not all data are equal in these cases. Pricing based on out of game data has some merit, but it's probably inferior. We tried this, we not only with the starter pack, but we did several more experiments, but it's way more difficult to do this compared to either in-game data or user history, because the data you have, you have out of game is very limited. Honestly, it's basically the device and uh, the location. But like new devices get released like every week or so. And if you want to keep up to date 
and even have to like assign some values to those devices, it gets really hard. We are still using it for starter packs, but it's something we hope to transition from in the next quarter or two. And the last part is the timing. So when to show. And I'm sorry, but this slide will be kind of general and I assume everyone knows it, but I still put it here. So there are several major ways to determine when to show the offers and kind of almost every game on the market uses at least most of those. The first one is calendar based. That's basically you just match to offer to important date. Like you can see it in the majority of games, there's special sale on Black Friday, Halloween and everything else. There's a progression based approach, again, like kind of common. You just connect the offer to some point in user's lifetime. For example, in our game, we have 11 arenas right now. And whenever you reach a new arena, you unlock new heroes. And you also see a brand new offer with those heroes. Uh, and the last one, that's what I want to talk about the most in the next few slides, is a trigger-based approach. And that can be basically anything. Your game just sends an event that triggers the offer. And this can be basically anything from the user lost two games in a row, the user unlocked a new character, our churn prediction model has decided that this user might leave in the next two days. Like, it can be anything. And let's look more into the triggers because I think that's honestly where the edit value lies because everyone knows that making Halloween offers on Halloween is good. There's nothing much, no rocket science there. And creating those triggers will definitely be very different for every game. It depends on the meta game you have. It depends on the users you have and even the system you are running on, I think. And it's important to test how quick can you be. I'm again going to illustrate on our example. When you first try these, like we are calling them real-time offers. But when you first try them, it took up to 20 minutes for the offer to, re to like be there. So if we kind of wanted to show we like to show you an offer after losing a match because you know like this hero was very strong and he beat you and he would like you to offer you this hero and you receive him 20 minutes later after you played five more matches, it's not gonna go well. So definitely find out how long your your real-time offers would take and if it's long longer, try to minimize the, the delay. We got from 20 minutes to like one one or two minutes. So and we are still trying to make it faster. You can always test the most common triggers. If you don't know where to start, they are like the industry standard basics. So you can test conversions on your offers if there's a major difference after the user wins or loses a game. This is probably gonna be different between like PvP or PvE games where the games are kind of different, but there are some like patterns that usually show, for example, in PvP, you are more likely to buy after you win a game. And if after that purchase, you win another game, you're likely to buy increases again. Well, at least in our game, I'm not saying it works everywhere, but I know of our and a few other games where this works. The testing offering a certain character after losing to it compared to offering it at a random. So for example, there's the new Chinese game Genshin Impact. I really like playing it. And I think they do this very well. Basically, there's like this very strong character and they show it to you. They like offer you the character for one dungeon. You, you run the dungeon with that, that character, you destroy it. Then you run it with your like basic free to play characters and you get destroyed. And if at that point in time, they like told me, uh, please put in your credit card and we will give you this hero, I would do it. So I think this can be really important that after a character makes a strong impression and you offer it, you should significantly increase your chances of converting the user to a spender. And some of our more recent attempts in this area. So our most recent model here is sending a trigger where the user, when the user is close to leveling up his character. It's actually slightly more complicated because we have, I think, two or three models running. The first model detects like the price, uh, the price tier of the user. So currently we have like several alternatives and the model determines whether the alternative for five, 10 or $15 is the user most likely to buy. 
After we put him into one of those categories, we do some math and find how much more cards and or gold does the user need for leveling up hero, heroes he likes. And once the user opens a new orb and he gets over the threshold and suddenly offer jumps up, hey, we are seeing you only miss 500 King Kongs. And if you buy this for $10 right now, you are guaranteed to receive all the Kongs you need in this next chest. And it works. It works very well, to be honest. It works even better than we expected. So yeah, I just said this. And the combination of more timings works for, works for us. I think this is, again, like kind of industry standard. You don't only have offers that are like real time. You basically have offers of almost every type there. So we are using the calendar-based offers. We typically use it for the huge offers, the ones like $30, $50. Basically, you create a very nice visual, for example, for Halloween. And you put a big price point there, and you put some amazing content there, and it usually sells. We have several offers you unlock progressing through the game. I already talked about those a little bit. Basically, the packs you get when you get the new arenas, if a chance to get the new heroes from those arenas. And then we are doing these shenanigans with the trigger-based and machine learning-based offers. And maybe one of the last things, be careful of showing too many offers at the same time, especially if you are trying to use things like regional pricing or something. What might happen is that the user sees like four offers at the same time, and one or two of them are strictly superior to any other offer there. Like It's not necessarily a bad thing in some cases. That's basically what behavioral economics is all about. Sometimes you want to put a terrible offer next to an average offer to make the average offer look better. But it also just be sure that you don't like overdo this, and a half or so of your offers would be just there to make the other offers look look good. And to wrap it up, I'm not sure how long it was supposed to be, but I'm parched. I think I've been talking for quite some time, so I'm just gonna repeat a few of the things that I've been talking about recently. So there are many ways to set up offers. Da like. Obviously, not putting all your eggs into one basket is important. Again, like I think it's very obvious, especially if you try to invest or something. You know that diversification is important, especially that one of my first learnings from game dev is that something always fails. Like our starter packs have not been working for for three days for a reason I don't even remember, but something very marginal and very hidden. Uh, the other day, our like calendar-based offer didn't work out. The other day, like something always goes wrong. So having multiple offers that can overlap is definitely good because the users still have something to buy. Monetization is an iterative process. What I mean by this is that you never, you should never stop. Like you should never be satisfied with where you're at. Like yeah, we increased our revenue or our art DAO. Uh, by 30%, but we are sure we can still do 30% more. So you should never stop attempting to improve your current setup. You should always be A-B testing something or trying to brainstorm a new hypothesis or come up with a new feature. Basically, you should never stop. And test everything before going all out. It's again connected to A-B testing or like any stress testing. Basically, if something fucks up, you want it to mess up your monetization scheme as few as slow as possible. And I think that's it. I have the tendency to speak very fast, especially when I get into it. So if that happened, I'm very sorry. And if there's a recording, I would recommend to play it at like 0.8 times the speed. Thank you, Mirek, for a really very interesting presentation. Uh, maybe for the end, like, you know, we have, of course, our, uh, like, you know, Q&A discussion uh, uh, session, but maybe one question uh, around this hypothesis for offers. You mentioned actually quite a, a few different ways how to, you know, hypothesis, uh, different ideas for, uh, for those offers. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, when you are actually you know, setting up the different tests uh, or like you, when you are like putting those different uh, uh, ideas uh, for, uh, for those offers, 
are there any like you know any you know factors that you would advise to look at uh, look at like you know take into specific consideration like uh, what do you think uh, how we should kind of you know uh, try to prioritize those uh, different ideas uh, uh, for for our game yeah i'm honestly not sure about how to prioritize i'd say what we are doing so for us we are trying to like put a price on almost everything uh, basically two prices one price is on the revenue side so by how much we expect the feature to mm -hmm. improve our revenue and the other one is on production side how difficult is this going to be for us to make how many developer, dev developers would it cost and then we just compare these two and we are looking for the low hanging fruit that makes the most back for the less, least bank mm -hmm. something like that and for getting those hypotheses themselves mm -hmm. i just like if I say it bluntly, you can, I, I would say steal it, but honestly, let's be inspired by it. There mm -hmm. are dozens of mobile games coming up like almost every day, and you should have someone in your monetization team like playing those games and understanding what they are doing differently. And if you mm -hmm. the difference between this game and your game is worth testing, test it. Thank you very much for for uh, for uh, presentation and answer. Of course. Uh, Please stay with us. Uh, uh, and now uh, let's invite uh, our uh, uh, next speaker, Martin. Let's invite Martin Gajorski from Pixel Federation, uh, who will be uh, sharing uh, his view on uh, and actually his experience how they were uh, optimizing hybrid monetization in uh, Pixel Federation games. Martin, I think you're mute. mute. <laughs> Sorry, hello everyone. Uh, can I now start sharing my screen? All right, can you see the presentation now? Cool, thanks. Uh -huh. All right, once again, hello everyone. My name is Martin Gajarski. I am a game designer at Pixel Federation. And today I want to talk about optimizing game design for hybrid monetization. Uh, this presentation will be made as a comparison between two of our projects at Pixel, train station number one and its sequel, train station number two. Uh, on, the, on one hand, we have train station one, which is our oldest live project. Uh, it's a project where our company grew with and we tried everything new with it and experimented and on the second on the other hand we have train station number two which is a sequel and where we wanted to use all of the experience we gathered over the years uh when designing the game from scratch uh just very shortly about me i'm designer at pixel i've been the lead designer for both train station one and train station two for a couple of years and i specialize in monetization system design product automation live ops I've been a designer for uh, six years now, so if it's quite fun, I can recommend it. Um, my company is Pixel Federation, some of you may know it, it's the largest game developer in Slovakia with about 200 guys. We are stationed in Bratislava, which is the capital of Slovakia, and currently we have six live free-to-play games. Uh, they are mostly transport simulations like Train Station and Train Station 2 and Seaport and puzzle games such as Diggy's Adventure. I would say we are a medium-sized company with about 40 million revenue so far this year. And what's, what's new or what's an update, 21% uh, out of that comes from rewarded videos, which have been implemented in the past two years in our company. Uh, I understand that Game Camp is mostly, or a lot of the attendees of Game Camp are game analysts or marketing guys. So I would like to offer a game design perspective on monetization. Uh, I believe game design is a combination of art and science. So on one hand, you need a strong creative concept and on the other, you need to back up your decision with uh, data. So, and hopefully in the end, you will get to a good game and to profit with regards to monetization. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first game I'm going to talk about is Train Station. It's a free-to-play railway tycoon. It's already 10 years old. Uh, 
we have uh, most of the monetization is based on in-apps and we have also added a uh, video uh, rewarded video subscription and offer walls uh, some at some point during the development of the game the second game is train station 2 the sequel it's also uh, rail transport tycoon for ios and android last launched last year with uh, 14 million lifetime registration and about 10 million revenues so far and what's interesting that it has a pretty high share of uh, video re rewarded video uh, revenue uh, the highest of our company our entire company most of our projects are about 20 percent and this one is between 35 and 40 percent on most months i actually wanted to show a short trailer if we have time for that All right, oh, so I, just, I wanted you guys to see what uh, kind of games I'm talking about. Let's move on. Uh, and the structure of this presentation will be in three parts. In first part, I will talk about optimizing monetization design for live games versus uh, for designing new games. The second part will be opti about optimizing video, uh, rewarded video placements. And the first third part will be about our company's experience with newer and more uncommon monetization formats. Part one, optimizing monetization design for live games versus new games. Uh, last year, I was speaking at Game Camp and uh, for train station number one, I basically summed up our monetization philosophy in three points. You should monetize what players want, even if it hurts your game design. Number two, you should monetize more than you think you should. That means including more offers, higher value, higher frequency and just try to find the sweet spot. But in, with most games, there's always space to increase the number of offers. And number three, that using rules one and two will probably very likely break your game economy. So you need to fix it afterwards. So, and this is the philosophy we went with uh, for Train Station 1, the 10 year old game. We have been monetizing new content we created for almost 10 years. Uh, over the 10 years, we created about 5,000 trains for sale for players. Uh, over, uh, after some time, we had to uh, start using really sophisticated uh, segmentation methods. For instance, this is a screenshot of our uh, flash offer feature, which, which creates a personalized segmentation dynamically uh, based on frequency and pr uh, payment frequency and price. And it moves along, the, moves the player along along a pattern or to, to give him the optimal offer based on his behavior. Uh, another thing for train station, it is incredibly dependent on whales. That means we have many players which are uh, which are willing to pay two hundred dollars each week for a new train pack. And the result of this is we have really high average revenue per paying user. The green line is train station number one. Uh, the black line is train station number two, and the blue line is seaport. Another of our tycoon projects, and you can see the train station number one has about uh, twelve dollars average payment for paying user while our other projects are between uh, seven and ten however this approach causes a lot of problems that i mentioned beforehand uh, selling so much uh, content creates value inflation in the late game uh, there's a huge performance gap between payers and non-payers and it's difficult to balance new content and offers because the payer, the balance is so inflated that you are unable, we are unable to target or to uh, create interesting content for or, and offers for the really high level players. However, none of these problems cause the game's decline and it's been successful for over 10 years. So it's not that bad. Uh, and you can also see that the monetization structure of Train Station 1 is incredibly heavily based on selling content with, with over 94% gems spent only on trains and accessories and only. 5% on mechanics. So this was the philosophy for train station one, which worked quite well for us for, for 10 years. However, when we started to do the sequel train station two, 
we thought it would be better to uh, or that we can do better and just prepare for the challenges ahead with, when designing the game. So for a new game, I would say the monetization rules uh, should sound like this. Number one, you should plan ahead what players you want to monetize and adjust the game accordingly. For PlayStation number two, the sequel, we wanted to monetize also selling new trains, but to a smaller degree, but also to increase the depth of created content by adding upgrade uh, an upgrade system, which can be used as a, which can be used for monetization as well as a sync for in-game resources and basically extend the time the player can uh, use one train they bought compared to just train station one where he immediately got the full power and just well didn't couldn't do anything more with the train uh number two rule number two is the same as with train station one you should monetize more than you think you should that never changes um you just need to try to find a sweet spot with your offers and number three you should account for being wrong in number one in your planning this has also happened to us with train station two so as i said we wanted to monetize both selling trains so that means content as well as upgrade parts or upgrade uh, resources for the trains and we were right with the upgrade resources which is one of our most uh, most sold types of content however uh the system the economy of the game makes buying new trains not that interesting because it's relatively easy to get them uh for free so basically we were right on one of our monetization methods and wrong on the other however we were still we were still able to uh develop the game or make the game profitable and that's because of the so that's because of we have a pr designed a pretty deep economy uh, a deep economy means that you are able to or it's basically the cornerstone of good monetization. Uh, having good monetization is really dependent on having a really deep in-game economy. And that basically means that you, the player is able to collect and spend a huge amount of resources on meaningful and satisfying actions and uh, for a very long time. So uh, for when designing TrainStation 2, we looked at all the uh, economy problems of TrainStation 1 and tried to find solutions. So summed up in this chart, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to use a couple of examples. So uh, one of the biggest issues was power inflation, where uh, with train station one, uh, players started off with numbers in the hundreds and ended in the trillions. So we wanted to avoid that and we created a tier system where for train station two, where basically every couple of levels, uh, the player enters a new region and hold the entire number balance basically restarts. This has several advantages. First, we can track the player's progress much better because we know, because there's not enough time for them to uh, uh, get out of like, our projections. Uh, the second thing is we can create offers which are available to players across the game. So uh, a powerful train is just as valuable for a player in Britain as for uh, as in France. Okay, second uh, solution to, to power inflation is having limiting resources. That means that the player isn't able to collect the resources indefinitely, but there are just some timed income brackets where he can get the valuable, re the valuable resource. Uh, this allows us to track the player's progress much better and to balance offers for them in a much simpler way. Then there's the, uh, then there's, uh, the upgrade system, which has depth to the content. I already mentioned that. So in the top row, you have the upgrade parts and in the bottom, you have the list of your trains with their respective power. And it takes much, it's much more difficult to upgrade the train to full power compared to getting a new one. But the game also creates incentives for players to have the most powerful trains and not just collect the weak ones. And also another so, uh, uh, solution to creating too much content is creating a gacha based system so it basically extends the time for the player to collect all of the items in the game and also for them to collect the resources they need so we use gacha for both uh, giving the players new trains as well as getting giving them upgrade parts uh, and psychologically is much more satisfying than just creating a system where you would have to collect one million parts uh, to upgrade your train it's much better to have them uh, have a random simple, random drops of parts and just rolling the dice 1,000 times compared or 100 times compared to just filling a million prog uh, strong progress bar.
And a pretty good uh, solution for to boost monetization is to create peer pressure and time pressure. Basically, what we did was, was create uh, small competitions twice a week. Uh, each of them lasts two days. Players are set in leagues with similarly strong players. And at the, each of every competition cycle, there is a monetization boost for uh, and uh, for gems and upgrade parts because the players want to be first. They want to win the reward as well as gain prestige. And this keeps them on their toes. Uh, while we are a casual game, there's quite a large segment of competitive players who are willing to participate in these competitions. All right. Marius just wrote me, I can hide the small overlay. I hope this was it. Uh, and the result of, so, and even though both of the games are uh, Tycoon simulators, uh, these changes cause two very different monetization systems. So on one hand, we had train station where it was really reliant on creating new content which was production intensive. And on the other hand, we created Trade Station 2, where the monetization uh, structure is completely different. So most of the gems spent are for resources and speed ups, compared to only just a small fraction spent on content. And the result is, was uh, similar, something like this. Uh, Trade Station 2 was able to reach the same or even higher in-app revenue per daily active user and our other projects while being much less reliant on content. So it's much easier for us to sell just upgrade parts or resources than creating new trains over and over and over. But and on top of this, there are also ad revenue, which I will talk about in the next slide. So part two is optimizing rewarded video design. Uh, for video uh, rewarded for rewarded video design, uh, basically the same holds as for in-app monetization that the good depth of economy supports all monetization formats, in-apps, rewarded video, offer wall, and so on. Uh, since when the player is able to spend game resources meaningfully uh, and in an entertaining way for a long time, it's much easier for you to design. Martin, sorry, can I interrupt you with the question uh, regarding like the first part before we move like to the second part? Yeah, sure, no, no, no problem. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much like for the first part. It's uh, very interesting uh, to see from your experience. Uh, you showed us like uh, the problems you had and the solutions that uh, worked. Can you maybe share a few, like, um, not failures, but let's say approaches that you tried, which uh, harmed actually the core game economy, like that uh, caused game decline uh, for others, maybe not to even uh, think of that and uh, do the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. I should have prepared them from the start. I need to think for a while, sorry. Uh, I'm not saying that there were no failures. Uh, however, uh, also a note with regards to Miroslav's uh, presentation, it was excellent. And it's uh, really, easy. I really recommend measuring everything when you do uh, have an older game. But for train station, since it's been live for only one year, it, the development cycles are much more hectic. So some of the things have not been measured. So it's difficult for us to say. But I would uh, say that uh, the biggest failure is our failure to be able to monetize new trains. We are still trying to create offers which offer like, uh, or for train station one, when we did a Halloween train or some unique collector's edition train, it was always a huge success. And for train station two, when we do uh, a pretty similar thing, it's difficult for us to get the players uh, excited about it. And it's probably because in the standard game, it's really, really easy to get uh, a base uh, free train, and then it's hard to upgrade it. So the players see no uh, purpose uh, for of buying uh, a stand or low power train. And what we are trying to do with it right now is, uh, and we also tried selling trains which are upgraded before uh, someone mentions that. However, uh, the players don't see the price uh, as, as or See, it's too pricey at the moment. So what we are trying to do right now is not sell a base powertrain and not sell uh, an upgraded train already, but to sell a base powertrain as, along with the parts that will allow you to upgrade it. And we believe psychologically it may seem that we are selling uh, quite a large bundle, which might lead to a higher conversion, but this is just only being developed. So uh, we're really hoping to sell more trains uh, on, in a train game. And maybe another failure was. 
Maybe you can think of it and then we come back to this question after the presentation, no worries. Yeah, actually, um, well, uh, the, I follow a couple actually right now. <laughs> One was that we, it was difficult for us to get the game monetized on, we started out without special offers and we just had uh, the standard gem shop for, for resources and for gems and resources. And you could also spend gems on uh, train containers and so on. And it really wasn't, it didn't work as, as we wanted. And you just really, really helped just adding the standard layer of special offers with basic segmentation, price segmentation and type segmentation or mostly price segmentation and then also timing with the competitions and everything. And this, it was basically a 2080 principle. We did the very basic segmentation setup and it helped increase the revenue tremendously over time. Uh, and we thought we wouldn't have to do that because the mechanics were already, we thought the star mechanics were good enough. And another failure, it's, well, it, it, it's regards to retention. Actually, the most problems we had was with, not with monetization, but re retention, which we were only able to get uh, to, the, to good levels in the spring after about a year and a half. But maybe I can talk about that on some other presentation. Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you. Go on with the second part. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. I seem to have turned it off. Okay. Sorry for that. Right, so part two, optimizing rewarded video design. Uh, as I, uh, I'm just gonna repeat the start. So even for rewarded videos, uh, it really, really pays off to have a deep economy. And the reason for that is that then it's much easier for you to create these spots in the game where you can give the player meaningful rewards for, vid for watching videos without having to worry too much that you are breaking the economy. And this is especially easy for when designing new games because you can, in all of the games, you have uh, content delivery systems, like maybe you get your daily reward or you get your, um, or you just want to give, want to, uh, give the player some resource over time or for doing some job. And when you do a new game, you basically just put, cut it in half and then say, okay, but double it to get the standard reward. And you have created a pretty cool uh, video placement. For older games, it's more difficult because usually there's some sort of equilibrium with the balance, and you try not to, and you don't want to uh, break your balance just because you added some rewarded video placement. So it always pays off to a deep economy. And uh, but basically, if I were just had to say one thing about rewarded videos, I would say that you need to uh, adhere to these three rules. The first one is the placement needs to be relevant to the economy. That means the player needs to want to use the placement or needs to want the, uh, needs to want the resource you are offering. The second is there should be no or very little access conditions. So it's much, much better to have a placement that can be accessible during any time when playing the app or playing the game compared to some placement that you need to play one hour for to get to. So maybe at some end of a level or something. There is space for that, but our experience is that you just end up creating too few options for the player to watch the ad comparing to something that they can access right away. And the third uh, rule for good video placements is to have it repeatable, to make it repeatable so that engaged players can watch more than one ad. And there are, here are some examples from, from our games. So this is from Train Station 1. Uh, on the left, you can see the mini a mini game. It's basically just you roll some random reward uh, resource from the game, including gems, and you can repeat your turn for watching an ad. So it's incredibly uh, very easy to access. You just need to open the gem window, which is also another trick that you get to players to look at the gems gem store, and uh, you can access them in any time in the game. And we even notify players when they haven't used up their charge per day. Uh, with train station two, we put it to the next level. I, I think 
with these dispatchers running around the station. So this is the player station and you have these small guys running around the tracks with a red notification over their head. And when you tap it, you can watch an ad for a reward. Uh, either you get a reward or you can watch an ad. And the rewards aren't very relevant to the player. They are quite small. However, uh, the strength of this is from a UX, user experience standpoint, standpoint of view. It's basically that you want to clear the notifications on your station, I would say. And since they are moving around, uh, moving objects are much, much harder to miss for a player. So we create a psychological need for the player to click on all of this and then watch it. So even though the reward is small, the player is still interested in watching it or clearing the screen. Uh, a more standard placement is uh, our uh, is this one, which is basically a sub supply of upgrade parts to improve trains in Train Station 2. So as I mentioned, upgrading trains is the most important part of the game. There are several ways to get upgrade parts, but the most reliable one is to collect your daily box or daily income box. The amount isn't that great, but over time it can uh, add up to a lot of uh, huge amount. So every engaged player knows he needs to collect his box every four hours, which is the time limit for it. And then another one for watching an ad. So basically a player can watch up to six ads per day, mostly five from just from this one placement. And the engaged players basically don't miss any, a single one of these because it's extremely relevant to the economy and repeatable. And an example of a bad placement is this one. I hope you can see the dark part in the background. This is basically uh, the option. We have a job generator in train station two, and this is basically the option to replace one of the jobs with another one you like better. However, uh, this placement is broken because the, the generator is balanced in a way that you always get uh, enough jobs that are good enough for you to play, and you can just ignore the bad ones. So we didn't create enough pressure for this placement to be re relevant to the economy. You can just ignore the bad two bad uh, jobs and you can always do one of the good ones. So this is one of our worst placements and it's just because of balance and the setup. But So you can always, so even though you make a placement easy to access, if it's not relevant to the player, they will not use it even if it's uh, not too difficult to use. And I would say all of our learnings from using placements can be summed up in this sheet. Uh, you don't need to like look at the whole of it. Let me just uh, mention a few examples. Uh, the best uh, in train station one, the best placement is the upgrade part container, which we saw previously. This one, and that's because it's highly relevant to the economy. It has no access condition. The player can uh, collect it at any time during his session, and it has up to six charges per day. So it has all the free conditions uh, well done. The second one is the station whistle, and that even though it's not that relevant to the economy. The player can use it up to 10 times. Uh, so it has a relatively low trigger rate. Uh, trigger rate is basically engagement for player engagement with the rewarded video or the portion of players that engaged with displacement. Uh, but only those who have already reached the high enough level. So not to those in the tutorial or anything. And uh, only 42% of players are engaged with displacement. However, since it has so many charges, it still makes up almost 14% of our uh, ad revenue. And on the bottom uh, part, we have the replaced train job, which I talked about. So it has low relevance to the economy. Uh, it has a uh, access condition because you need to have a uh, difficult uh, job you don't like. And even though it has many charges, it only accounts for point uh, for 0.21% of our ad revenue. So if I were to only have two or three placements in train station, I would definitely make them relevant to the economy, uh, easy to access without no conditions and uh, have several charges per day. Uh, this is the same sheet for train station number one. Uh, the problem we had with uh, adding rewarded video placements to an older game is it was hard for us to make them relevant to the economy because there was already a sort of balance in the amount of resources the player was getting. So we didn't. So if some of the placements are have medium relevance, but none of them have a high one. And also, it was difficult for us to repeat the charges for the same reason, which meant that even though uh, even though they have a relatively good trigger rate and uh, trigger rate, uh, overall the ad revenue or ad engagement in train station number one is much much lower than train station two. You can see it in this chart. 
the green line is train station number one, the black line is train station number two. So for train station number two, it's uh, over 80% of players engaged with uh, video ads daily. And for train station number one, it's just around 55%. And I would say it's for these reasons. Uh, you can also see we have for train station two, we have a much higher number of impressions per daily active user uh, compared to number one. Also, uh, our ad revenue per daily active user is much, much higher for train station number two. And I would say the reasons for this are that it was designed with displacements in mind and the depth of the economy allowed us to give much more valuable, uh, valuable rewards for watching one. Uh, one more thing I need to add is that the technical aspect of rewarded video is extremely crucial. Uh, at the start, when we, we started with video ads with, for train station number one, is our first project to have them in Pixel Federation. And there were a lot of technical problems we needed to fix. Uh, there were many times the ads were not available. And even when they were not available, we didn't have uh, a backup option uh, that is either giving the player the reward right away or to give him uh, an ad for one of our games. Otherwise, we got a uh, great many tickets that were complaining that the ad is not available because for engaged players, watching the ad is part of their daily session. They do it every single time they can to optimize their performance. And when we don't allow them to do it, they basically get mad because they expect it already. Also, it's beneficial to have several ad providers and mediation among them and uh, decide on the best uh, and a way to select the best uh, value ads that are being offered at the time, either through manual waterfall or real-time bidding. Uh, this is not really my area of expertise, but I would just like to highly recommend a presentation of my colleague, Michael Hablovich, which is gonna be in December, also in Game Camp. I think it's already on the web Game Camp website, so don't miss out on that. Yeah. And to sum it up, uh, or to, uh, but get to the final part, uh, I would just want to shortly speak about our experience with newer and more uncommon monetization formats, which you have probably heard about, but they are not available in every single game. So what we tried so far, some of them interstitial ads, uh, just to explain what the this is. When you, uh, rewarded videos are videos that the player triggers uh, with the intention of getting some reward, while, while interstitial ads are ads that are triggered uh, automatically for the player, usually for people who don't uh, trigger that many ads manually. And it's basically a way to get video, re video revenue from players who would not do it otherwise. And we have tested it on one of our projects called Seaport. It's also a simulation game, a tycoon simulation game. And uh, it resulted in 16% worse day free average revenue per user for new players. So we tried a second round with adding uh, more interstitials because the hypothesis was there was that uh, there are not enough ads to make up for maybe the loss in uh, in-app revenue. However, it turned out even worse. So we have not given up, but so far interstitial ads have not worked in Pixel, but maybe for train station two, they will when we try it sometime. Then the second monetization tool is uh, we have tried is the offer wall to explain an offer wall is basically uh, a list of offers which uh, to do, which requires the player to do some small task in another game than ours, like uh, state of survival or whatever. For instance, reach level ten in state of survival, so the player installs the second game through this through our UI, uh, plays the game until level ten, and then he gets uh, gems within our game. So it's basically like do this small job for us to get a gem reward. Uh, and when the player does it, the, our company or our uh, our game gets uh, similar revenue as if he were to buy the gem pack in our game. So if he does, for instance, uh, 480 gems is about $20 in our game. So when the player completes this offer, we get $20 for it. And we tested it, uh, we A-B tested it this summer and it resulted in plus 6% plus average revenue per user just for this one feature without uh, without any in-app cannibalization. It's also, uh, so I, I would recommend it quite highly. It was really easy to implement because most of the work is done on uh, the with third party software and you just edit and you get 6% extra without any, without too much work. Then we tried the event pass. 
we tried it on three of our projects in the company and we have settled that the 15 euro is a price optimum for us uh in most games you know the pass probably costs about five dollars or just to explain the pass the event pass is a feature where you have or event pass or season pass where you log in uh during a time period for instance a month where there is an event or just uh, some sort of activity going on and each day you do a couple of uh tasks to get a small reward it looks something like this so for our event pass so you move along the event xp line in the middle and you are able to collect three rewards at the bottom and if you buy the event pass you can collect more valuable rewards at the top and uh, we have tried a five euro event pass for one of our games however the revenues were not that impressive and uh, and for train station 2 we tried uh, and for digi 2 we have tried a 15 euro uh, event pass which resulted in pretty high conversion six percent and it also became the best revenue pack in train station 2. Uh, we also did uh, another a b test or we all we were thinking about doing an a b test but we decided against it for the reason that we have a pretty active community so it would be uh hard from a communication point of view not to give players half of the players uh such a significant feature uh for smaller packs it's always recommended to a b test but for this one we decided against it even for a 90 to 10 percent distribution uh, of the pass again with the control group because it would take too long for a 10 percent group to provide us with the uh, sufficient data so we just do it before after test and it turned out that the average revenue per user increased slightly or uh about five to six percent however it was difficult to balance not to cannibalize our other offers as Mirik was talking about uh, in his previous presentation but overall it's uh, we consider it a success and it needs more testing and the third one is a subscription based monetization it basically means that the player gets charged every month every month to receive some small reward or maybe some premium account we did it with daily gems for train station one and it was mostly intended as the first payment the player does in the game to get uh, it was to get for 2.99 he would get gems a couple of gems every day and the overall value was much much higher than 2.99 would get him uh, elsewhere in the game but what happened with this game was that uh most of the subscriptions were bought by uh high payers and whales so in the end it's caused a uh, significant cannibalization of other offers because these guys now got, I don't know, 200 gems in the month or 500 gems in a month for uh, $3. And otherwise they would have paid 10 to 15 for them. So for us, this was not a win and maybe you can make it work, but so far we haven't been able to. Okay. So, and I'm basically at the end. I'm not sure what the time, I, when I was supposed to end. Uh, so to summarize the points from this presentation, uh, when designing monetization, uh, the core thing is that monetization is a subset of the game economy. It's not like its own existing system. And you need to create, within the game economy, you need to create the motivations for the player to spend. Otherwise, you can uh, do A-B testing and segmentation. You can have perfect all of these things. And it, when you don't have a good economy, the packs won't work. And a key to have a good economy is to have uh, good depth. That means that you are able to the player is able to spend the resources meaningfully for a long, long time without it breaking your balance on, or getting to a fin to a finished state of the game or like and without using up all of the options. And for rewarded video, if I had to tell you one thing to remember, it's that you should follow three guidelines when designing it, make them relevant to the economy, uh, make them easily available and make them repeatable and then the video placement will have a lot of impressions. And that's about it. So thanks for your attention. Uh, maybe we can now go to a Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, this presentation was quite... Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think it was, re I think it was really, really good. Uh, I really enjoyed that, that, that presentation. Uh, and uh, that, uh, like, you know, uh, let's invite uh, Mirek and uh, uh, Anastasia as, as well. And maybe let's let let's start with like one question that was kind of even directly to sent to you. Do you think it's possible to modify the depth of economy for the existing game, like the game that exists for like a few years already? Do you think it's like 
possible, realistic? How how what is your view on, on that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's always quite difficult to do that. Um, I would recommend our philosophy when doing this with older games is was not to change the economy as much. You can always tweak it like uh, a couple of or maybe like fifty percent, but uh, just completely turn it around. However, what I would recommend is basically add a new game system that is more entertaining than the one uh, or more interesting than the one you already have. So if you even have broken economy, you can just add a new loop like guild play gameplay or treasure hunt or something which and make it the focus of the game. And there you can do the balance from scratch and you can have it under control and maybe and even, uh, and even focus monetization on this one loop. We actually did it quite successfully with one of our simulation games, Seaport, recently, where we added a treasure hunt game loop, and it increased the monetary, the RP. I'm, I'm not sure how much, but it was a success. Sorry, it's not my project, but I wanted to come up with an example. <laughs> so always go. It's easier to add new things than to do significant changes to an old game because the player base might react negatively in the end. It's basically our experience from other projects. I just wanted to jump in. I agree with Martin. Basically, what he said makes sense. We tried uh, on our game too, like to change the economy. And what we found out is the best approach I would take is to just add a new meta game loop. Basically, what Martin said, right? If something that if something doesn't work, instead of like redoing it from scratch, add something new. If your economy is too exponential, add a second monetization loop that is more linear, or basically something like that. Anastasia, maybe you would like to ask something? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I actually wanted to uh, follow up on the hybrid monetization and to like ask question first mine and then maybe from Slido, sorry. Um, uh, the question is, uh, is basically like the uh, eternal question and how do you, how do you guys like balance between AAP and ads? Uh, and uh, what actually metrics factors do you consider? Like, do you uh, stream, like uh, dis di distinguish like payers from non-payers? Do you use that driven approach for that, or what is the current approach works best for you? Um, sorry. Was that, was, that, was that me or Martin? I kind of felt was it Martin? A both of you. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Mike, if you have. I I kind of heard like the AAP versus ads. So, for example. For we don't really optimize ads that much. In all honesty, we implemented ads in our game like half a year back, and we managed to make it work somehow. We didn't even like iterate that much. We, I think our second iteration actually worked very well. So we kind of are, um, ads are not like what we focus on that much right now. So, but, but cannibalization wise, I think it's like, uh, sorry, sorry. To re reiterate, what we are doing, we are not differentiating between payers and non-payers. I heard some of the like popular theories that you just show ads to non-payers to monetize them. What we are doing, we are only offering rewarded videos. So if you don't want to pay, you have the option to watch the ad. And we are usually doing rewarded videos that you can either get the thing for a small payment, let's say one dollar, or you can watch some ads to get the thing too. But in our honesty, we are not doing as much work on ads as we probably should have. I'll pass it on to you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for us, it depends on the project. Um, for Train Station 2 that we have been designing from scratch, uh, we basically intended for some systems to work with ads from the start. So there might be cannibalization. Uh, I'm not sure if I would call this cannibalization because if the only way for us to, for to get one resource is through a rewarded video system, and that, or to buy it, um, I think in, I, I'm not even sure how we would measure it because we have to turn off the, like essential game system. But if we were to do a new placement, we um, we have a placement called temporary dispatcher, which allows you to use one more train for a short time, and it's limited to six hours. And if you were to increase, and it's really popular, and if you were to increase the frequency to maybe one hour, we would definitely A-B test it because this one also competes with uh, one of our popular offers to buy more of those, uh, more of those dispatchers to have more trains at once. So I would say that 
uh, in general, I would add uh, as many ad placements in a new game even, uh, as possible because I think it uh, monetizes quite a different segment of players than in-apps. If you're a payer, you're not going to be satisfied with what the ads offer you, but even if you're not, but you are still going to use them uh, if, both for non-payers and payers. So uh, we have not really tested that much for cannibalization for ads because the amounts you can buy versus what you get from an ad are so like vastly different. But if we were to do a powerful uh, placement, we would test it basically. Thank, Thank you. And there was like the, the question around uh, uh, if you see any changes in monetization flow, uh, if you notice anything during the COVID, like not just uh, related to pure monetization, okay, the monetization increased or decreased, usually increased, but uh, did you see any changes in the flow? Like, did you see any changes in the user's behavior in, in, in your games or? Like? From the data that I know of, which is mostly our data and a few other companies I talk to, uh, the only, there were like not many significant changes. When, when I think that if you compare it to, for example, like consoles and PC games where there was a significant increase because everyone sits at home and plays more games now because of the lockdown. Uh, for phone games, especially ones like ours, which is like a mid-core PvP game, and you, it's a game you usually play when you are like commuting to work or sitting on a toilet. There was like no major change. There was no positive change we found out at all. And there was even a small negative change that our lifetime of the users went slightly down, which we attribute to the, when people have more time, they are trying out more games and they are less likely to stick with your game because there's a lot of other options. And other, other companies I talked with, they basically said that they, they have no effects or like very small uplift. But if there was an uplift, it was usually a very casual game or a very hardcore game. Martin, how? Yeah, um, I, like our CEO goes around saying that uh, COVID like helped our revenues, but I'm not sure if we had any data to back it up. Um, I, I would say that uh, it, it was not, it's not measurable. We had, uh, for games where we did significant changes, we had an uplift in revenue this year. However, we had also games that were decreasing in revenue. So it's really hard for us, to, for me to tell. And we didn't do any specific analysis like between the, during and after COVID. We know just from uh, feedback from our players that they say they are playing more or they just, at least they have something to do. We are a casual game without, uh, for really like soft core players. And um, I have no idea if COVID helped, only like uh, anecdotal. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, let's go maybe to the next question. Uh, how many tests do you do at once? How do you split the users if you have around 2.5k users daily? How many users per test group are enough? Okay, so I'll start from the end. How many users are enough? Basically, what we're doing is just like conforming to the law of large numbers, which basically says that any data sample larger than 300 users can be significant. And we are basically trying to get the group between 300 and 1,000. And the only issue that can happen is if the event you are testing for is like far in the future, let's say it doesn't happen on day one, it happens on day seven, then I'd say it's important to adjust for, for your re retention because you want to have the at least 300 users there by the time you the event you're testing happens. Um, how do you split the users? I think that like 50-50 is the very basic one. Around those user numbers, I, it depends what I'm testing. If I was testing something that happens on the first day, I wouldn't mind doing like uh, only, te only testing it on 20 or 10 or 20% of the audience. If I was doing something that happens later in the progression, I would do 50-50 to make sure enough users survive until that time. And how many tests do you do at once? For us, it's just one test. Because the issue is that once you start doing multiple different tests, there can be some undesired effects because for every test, the user has to be a part of either the test group or the control group. And you have to make sure that the, that the users that are in the control group are unaffected by any test. So for us, we are just sticking to one test at a time to make sure we don't corrupt our data by like some 
interference from other tests where our control group gets polluted by people who are in a different different test and something there goes wrong, which would invalidate every test in, that, that you are doing. I think that's it. Yeah, I basically agree with uh, everything. For um, most of the A-B tests we do are for, we like to, the thing we A-B test the most is early retention. And that's because there are, uh, you can work with large numbers there because it happens on day one, as Nick said, and, as, and you can get the data quickly. For monetization, it takes usually longer to get significant dif differences for us. Uh, I'm not really want to talk about it, but I think we started using Bay Bayesian uh, differences and, and it allows us to use smaller numbers. However, yeah, so 50 50 uh, red, uh, early game events are easier to measure. And that's about it for us. And yeah, we don't mix uh, A B test to more A B tests at once. We tried it. Uh, when we do it, we make do like four groups for one test. So three test groups and one control group. But we never do like two features uh, at once because of interference. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, like there is the question if you profile and it started part by paid organic, like you no, know, Martin, Mirek was mentioning about different ways to to uh, profiling those uh, started parts, but have you seen anything like, you know, by the channel uh, or um, how does it look like on your site? Maybe starting Mirek from you. Okay, so we tried it and we didn't stick with it. There are several reasons for it. The first one is we never managed to have like 100% attribution between paid and organic. Because sometimes, even if like the attribution uh, system works correctly, the user might see the campaign and then on his iPad and then install it on his uh, Android phone. So he's seen as organic, even though he's not. So there's always some like, you can never say like with 100% accuracy which group the user belongs to. The second issue is that uh, the paid and organic users correlate, as, at least for us. If you start a huge CPI campaign in Russia, it means that even your organic users are in are gonna be more like CPI users in, in, in Russia, just because those guys have friends and word of mouth and everything. So we never were like, and we didn't even find like any reason to do it. Basically, there was there were the issues I mentioned, and we never found any uplift, especially when I compare it to the method we are using right now. Uh, the paid slash organic didn't have any improvement over it. It just it was just more complicated to make sure you segment correctly. Thank you. Martin? Yeah, um, basically the same as Mirek said, when we do a huge uh, paid campaign, usually organic picks up, picks up uh, in a similar fashion and we don't really do anything different for them. Um, the only time that organic lifts up in, uh, more than uh, paid ads is when we get some sort of uh, spon not sponsoring, but featuring in one of the app stores. And that usually happens only, it, usually it's arranged beforehand, so we can expect that. But we don't do anything different with regards to segmentation uh, of packs or anything. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, another question that we have is regarding the user segmentation. Uh, so it's also Mirak was talking about segmenting users like based on the region, or based on the uh, the power purchasing power. So here's a question: Is if uh, you segment users based on the behavior in the game into the segment, like not only purchasing power, but what, uh, how are they playing, what are they doing, and if there is any psychological framework for making clusters which will have different offers. Okay, so I'll try. I'm not 100% sure I will answer in the way that the question was meant. But the first question, do you segment players? Yes, we do. We are using in-game data to get segmentations uh, for those groups. We are not necessarily only using it for offers, but we are basically, what we are doing is we are looking at players that are, let's say, loyal, that play, that have longer sessions, play longer, Players who basically have, I think, four segments right now. I don't want to go into details because I would mess it up, sorry. But 
psychological framework wise i don't think i think there might be some psychological framework but at least i do not know of it so we are doing it mostly because it works revenue wise psychology wise i'm sorry but i don't think i'm like good enough to answer yeah uh, for us um we of course segment as well uh, for all the project projects the segmentation is always a bit more complex because they have tried more things we segment on price frequency uh, last uh, time of uh, last purchase and stuff like that and we create many segments uh, for some games we have like uh, 60 segments out of that but for train station we do a pretty basic segmentation based on uh, uh, highest payment in a time period and so with regards to psychological uh, segmentation or like if you mean like player behavior in the game like if uh, someone is more of a collector compared to a competitive player or something like that i would say um i think for us it was the problem that we never really had a game where we had uh, such strong uh, player which would you have comparably strong player behaviors you know like when we have train station uh, most of the players want to buy the same thing and that is uh, upgrade parts for their trains and they don't really want to uh, that many packs for side loops so it doesn't really make sense for us to create a whole segmentation only for one type of behavior can we basically just do all the packs and if a player wants to do everybody gets the same packs or uh, a huge uh, and if a player wants to buy one he buys that one so uh, yeah the problem for us is that we don't have games which have such significantly different gameplay seg uh, gameplay styles which we could base the segmentation on we tried but it wasn't uh it was really difficult to define and it was probably not worth the effort to go into it from the start it's much I would recommend starting with payment frequency and uh pay price and go and then just maybe do a more sophisticated system to play with these two parameters and not go into behavior as much but it depends on the game thank you very much uh so uh so we have actually last question around the recording yes yeah, so we, we are recording that and of course if if Mira and martin will be okay uh, we'll be sharing the recording as well uh, for now, uh, I really want to say thank you to, to Martin, Mirek, and Anastasia for like you know, spending time and sharing their experience with, with us. Thank you really uh, for, for your knowledge sharing and uh, uh, just saying uh, uh, thank you to, for everyone to spending time with, uh, with, with us. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, feel free to check our website for some another webinars happening in the next uh, weeks. Uh, we, we will be trying to uh, to share them earlier, a few weeks in advance. So uh, feel free to do it. Of course, uh, we'll be really uh, appreciating any feedback. Uh, I hope you you were able to to check in, uh, and then once you check in, you you will get the email with the question around the feedback. Uh, feel, uh, please uh, share that feedback with us because it helps us to make it uh, better and uh, answer to which extent uh, uh, such sessions are uh, useful for you. Uh, so Martin, Anastasia and Mir Mirek, thank you for your time. Uh, see you around. Thank you as well, everyone, Mario, for inviting and uh, Mirek, Martin, it was very interesting uh, uh, speeches. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, Mario, for the event. And thank you, everyone, for listening to us for a while, I guess. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.